Hey everybody, it's Tim for Tim Krause Electronics, and as you can see, I am not in my workshop today. I wanted to do a, a quick video for those of you in the DIY community who've been looking for a better way to apply the graphics to your effects pedals. Now for those of you who have been following my videos, you've already seen the first part of the, uh, the cheap versus expensive distortion pedal build. Today I'm getting the enclosures ready for that build. Now I've seen a lot of videos out there on various methods of applying the graphics to your effects pedals. And while a lot of you have gotten really good results, it seems to me that uh, a lot of those methods are chosen kind of as an alternative to the obvious first choice, which is screen printing. Now I'm not saying that screen printing is the only way to get really nice results. In fact, most of my pedals use uh, laser etched uh, plates instead of screen printing. But screen printing is the industry standard for a reason. You get very professional looking and durable results. Now most of us would never even consider screen printing as an option because at first glance it seems like it would be um, too big of an expense with, with too steep of a learning curve uh, for us to want to get into it, but it's really not that bad. In fact, if you're already uh, printing water slide decals and then clear coating, you already know half of what you need to know in order to do a good screen printing job. So for those of you who are considering screen printing, I wanted to share with you some of the experience that I gained through this process so that hopefully you have an easier time than I did. Now, first of all, I want to show you the graphics that I've come up with for this build. If you've been watching this series, you know that this build is kind of a, a little bit Big Muff, a little bit Pete Cornish G2, and you know some of my own changes in there as well, different tone control. And I wanted some way to tie it into, you know, some kind of Pink Floyd theme, um, because you know I'm, the whole reason I'm doing this particular circuit is because I like this, the sounds that David Gilmour has gotten on a lot of his tracks. So I came up with the name Oberon uh, from the, uh, the line in Astronomy Domine where it mentions Oberon, Miranda, and Titania, which are uh, three moons in our solar system. And I know Sid Barrett played guitar on that. He played a, a telly straight into a Selmer amp. There was no big muff on that track, but I don't care. I like the name. Now Oberon was um, uh, a fairy king. Yeah, I know it sounds like totally metal, right? But anyway, uh, Oberon was a fairy king. He was uh, featured in William Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, I'm sure it, you know, it probably predates that by, by quite a bit, but um, he's often depicted with a crown of antlers. So I found a bunch of images I liked and kind of stitched them together. I found the, uh, the sword in one place, the crown in another place, the antlers, the wings, and, and just kind of, you know, made some modifications here and there and then and compiled it into one image in Adobe Illustrator. And, uh, but you can, you know, whatever program you've been using for your graphics is fine. Um, I exported it as a bitmap and then printed it from a um, word processor program. You know, whether you're using Word or OpenOffice, if you insert a bitmap image into a document, it usually does a pretty good job of printing actual size. So, on to the screen printing. This is a Udo. It's kind of an all-in-one screen printing station. And it's not perfect. There are some things that I, I don't really like about it, um, but it has some really big advantages uh, specifically, it's got a drying rack built in. It's also got a light box built in so that you can burn your images. It does make the job a lot easier. You know, you slide the, the screen in there and hit the fan button and it dries the rack for you instead of having to find a dark place where it's not going to get, uh, you know, bumped by anything and, and you've got some airflow. But you don't need to spend a lot of money to get into this. You need a screen, a squeegee, a scoop coater, and something to remove the emulsion when you're, when you're uh, cleaning the screen, cleaning the design off of the screen to start with a new design. And you can get a starter kit that has all these things in it, all the basics that you're going to need, for about a hundred bucks. Now I realize that's not exactly pocket change, but it's not a lot of money either. And if you're going to build a lot of pedals, why not make them look as good as they sound? Now I'm not going to take you through the whole process of screen printing. There are plenty of videos out there that will do that. I want to talk about some of the challenges that are specific to printing on effects pedals. I finally have a usable screen, but I didn't get it right on the first try. Or the second try. Three times a charm? 
Not for me, it isn't. No, it took me five tries to get a usable screen. So some of the things that I learned as I continually failed at this, first of all, use a high PPI or DPI setting when you print. I think the, the default for a high quality print is usually about 300 pixels per inch, but that's not high enough for something like this because you need a very detailed image. If we're working with t-shirts, that doesn't have to be real detailed. But when we're printing on an effects pedal, some of the lettering is really small and those little tiny lines, if you don't have a nice crisp edge and really well-defined image, um, those letters aren't going to come out. There are a lot of things that you can get away with when you're printing t-shirts that you can't get away with uh, when you're doing this stuff. So use uh, at least 600 pixels per inch. If, you're, if your printer will go up to 1200, use 1200. Export a bitmap, not a JPEG. That's one of the reasons one of these screens was a failure because uh, I, I accidentally exported a JPEG instead of a bitmap and I didn't realize until after I, I had burned the image and rinsed the screen that uh, it wasn't the right size anymore. If you use a bitmap, I don't know why, but for some reason it does a better job of just automatically printing actual size, so you'll save yourself some headaches there. Next, double up on your transparency. I have, this is actually the one that, that failed that was too big. I have two transparencies here that I've lined up. You, you really gotta line them up perfectly, but it will line up and then uh, I've put a couple pieces of tape on there just to hold them together. Um, the reason I do that is because the toner is not going to block all the light out. And just like using uh, a low PPI setting where you've got a bunch of interstitial uh, holes between the pixels where the light is shining through, if you're only using one sheet of transparency film, the amount of toner that's on there is not enough to block all of the light and you're going to end up partially exposing the stuff that you don't want exposed and then it's not going to rinse away cleanly and you're going to lose all of your definition and you probably won't be able to read any of your lettering anymore. The next thing is put some weight on top when you're burning the image. Um, if you're burning it from the top, I always like to put a sheet of glass over it. Um, that way it, it holds the image flat against the screen. Uh, but in this case, it actually burns it from the bottom, so I had to put some, some weight on top of this uh, tray here just to make sure that the image was being pressed firmly against the screen. Any little cracks around the sides where the light can, can get under the image, it's going to ruin your image and you're going to have fuzzy edges, and once again, your lettering's not going to come out right. The next thing is, don't overexpose your image. This is another thing where if you're just doing t-shirts, it doesn't really matter. If you overexpose the image, yeah, you have to scrub a little harder and a little bit longer to, to, to rinse your screen so that you can print. Um, and if you lose some definition, you're probably not even going to notice. But in this case, you really don't want to overexpose your screen. I just assumed that the 10-minute the setting that this machine defaults to was the right setting. And it was not. And I was getting really terrible results. So I backed it down to eight minutes and it was still overexposing it. I finally went online and looked up uh, someone else that had the same issue. Uh, they were using the same brand of emulsion that I'm using and uh, they recommended five and a half minutes. So I did five and a half minutes and it turned out great. Uh, next time I might even drop it down uh, lower than that because this is I use the Speedball brand and it just doesn't need the same uh, exposure time as the uh, um, the sheets that come with this Udo kit. So if you're uncertain about that, save yourself some headache and go online, find someone else who's using the same brand of emulsion that you are and find out what exposure time they used with similar light sources. And the last thing is, don't expect more detail than your screen can provide. If you get a real fine mesh screen, then yes, it is possible to get some really, really fine detail out of that screen. But that also means that you've got to do an absolutely flawless burn. And, you know, until you've got some experience, it's just not a good idea to expect your screen to do that much for you. So if you've got some really fine lettering on, on the top of your pedal, consider using a different font. You may eventually get the results you're looking for, but how many times are you going to have to, you know, toss the screen and start over before you get to that point? Okay, I've got some ink on the screen here. 
and uh, this is my very first attempt, so uh, we'll see how this goes. And it's a little light in a couple of areas. So um, I'm actually going to try this over again. I'm going to wipe down this uh, enclosure because I just don't trust that I'm going to get everything in the exact same spot that I did before. So, okay, I've cleaned the screen off. I'm going to try this again. This is, uh, you can probably see here, this is really thin ink. And uh, I don't know if this is just typical of water-based inks or what, but uh, I'm going to have to use lighter pressure this time. I'll put a little extra ink on the screen so that I don't have to, uh, uh, so that I can uh, flood it more quickly. And that's no good either. I can already see it spreading on there. Well, I had to stop recording. Uh, I ran into some trouble with the, uh, the printing process, and uh, but no joke, I, I must have tried 30 times to get it to print correctly. I, I tried it once, it was it, it smeared, so I washed that off. Fortunately, this water-based ink is really easy to rinse off. You just run it under some water and, and just rub right off. Um, if it's a little bit thin, it'll start to dry on there, uh, but just use some soap and water and it'll come off. The second try worked great. After that, I could not get it to work again. And I think part of the reason was because the first one was the silver enclosure. It was a brighter color. It was easy to see the position under the screen. The second one was that darker green color, and I had a really tough time lining it up. So the few times that it wasn't smudged, it wasn't aligned properly. So I tried a number of times and just could not get it right. So I finally had to uh, drive over to my workshop, which is 20 minutes away from here. I built myself this. The reason I had to build this was because this part of, of the UU where the, the screen actually sits, it's really flimsy. It is not very stable at all. It's not good for anything but t-shirts, uh, maybe you know posters and stuff like that. But as soon as you get something thick, like an enclosure, it, it just doesn't cooperate. You know, it's got these these legs actually slide up a little bit so that it will accommodate thicker uh, materials. But then when you do that, it, it's just not stable anymore. And um, I would get it positioned just right and then as soon as I as soon as I did a pass on the screen, it was in a completely different spot than before. So uh, I had to build this and all I did was I took this part off of the Udo and put a hinge on the back and then uh, put a couple of pieces here and here so that when it's down, that's not going to move anywhere. And also on this piece, I've got it, uh, I made this, uh, this is specifically for this size enclosure. I would have to make a different one for each size enclosure that I want to use, but that holds it really securely in there so that that won't move. And then I've got it clamped in place. So one very important thing with screen printing on your enclosure, everything has to be stable. It cannot be allowed to move at all. And in fact, when I put the screen in here, I put some tape around the edges to make sure that the screen doesn't slide around at all when I'm pulling, uh, when I'm doing a pass on here. So I did eventually get some really nice results. And uh, what I did to dry it, this, this water-based ink does take quite a while to dry. I, I left it out for several hours thinking that it would dry on its own and it still wasn't dry. So what I did was I put it in the oven at the lowest temperature, which is 170 degrees, 170 degrees for this oven, and uh, put it in there for about a half an hour, and that dried it really well. And then I heat set this uh, artwork on uh, an electric griddle. I set it to uh, 300 degrees. It, the, the ink says it needs 320 degrees to cure. I set it at 300 degrees. Fortunately, I had a candy thermometer uh, in the kitchen, so I was able to verify the temperature because it was actually up around 370 degrees, so I had to turn it down. Once I got the right temperature, I left it on there for a couple of minutes, and uh, it didn't cure fully. It still rubs off a little bit. If there's anyone watching this video who's got more experience with screen printing, uh, feel free to chime in. Maybe there's something I'm missing there. But uh, I just put a paper towel down on the grill and then set this face down on there and put some weight on top of it for a couple of minutes. 
I will be uh, clear coating these just because the, the, the ink, like I said, it still rubs off a little bit. Um, if, if I had used uh, Plastisol ink, I think I would have gotten better results in that regard. Um, Plastisol inks are a lot easier to cure. That's one of the drawbacks of using a water-based ink is that it's really tough to cure. So uh, if you're going to do this, you probably want to get a Plastisol ink. Another thing about the ink that I was using, apparently the person that I bought this stuff from had thinned the ink. So my ink is, is a little thinner than it comes from the factory. And they probably did that because they were using a high mesh screen. Now, I thought that I had bought high mesh screens, but I bought them so long ago I couldn't remember. I bought 156 mesh. I really should have been using a 220 mesh screen for this. So if you're going to do this, either use a thicker ink or get a high mesh screen. Um, you can, I think you can go all the way to 300. I don't think that's necessary. Um, but uh, 156 was definitely too coarse for what I'm doing here. I needed a thicker ink. Now also on these enclosures, this is a two color design because I've got the uh, my U YouTube logo on the bottom left corner just like it shows up in the videos, the TK in red and the, the E is in black. Uh, so I had to let the black ink dry completely before applying the red ink. And when I did that, I forgot to tape the screen in place. So I got it perfectly lined up, which was really easy once I built this thing. It was super easy to line it up, so I definitely recommend building something like this. If you are going to build your own uh, rack for holding your screen, you probably ought to build in some way to clamp the screen in place uh, so that it doesn't slide around at all. And like I said, I forgot to tape this, so as soon as I uh, did a pass with the red, the screen actually slid down and uh, so these letters were a little bit low, so I, I tried to clean them off without disturbing the black, but I wasn't able to, and it actually, I had to uh, remove the, uh, a little bit of the black pinstripe around the edge there just to make it look like, you know, it was supposed to be there. So just to recap, make sure that you have some way of permanently aligning your enclosure so that you can just take one enclosure out, put the next one in, and you don't have to uh, realign it because trying to, to do it by sight, by looking through the screen, can be really difficult, especially if you've got a darker color. Um, and once the screen's been used once, it makes it even harder to see through there. Make sure that everything is very stable. Make sure nothing is able to move around at all because as soon as you start pulling that ink, things want to move. Make sure that the ink is the correct thickness. Make sure that your screen is the correct mesh. Now there's no magic formula for that, but again, my uh, coarse mesh screen was just... It didn't work well with, with the thinner ink, and if I had had either thicker ink or a finer mesh, I think I would have gotten better results. If you'd rather not have to clear coat after you do your screen printing, I definitely recommend Plastisol inks because they cure a lot more easily than these water-based inks do. So that pretty much sums it up. Uh, I think I made every mistake you could possibly make uh, in this process, so you're welcome. I hope that some of you will try screen printing your enclosures now. You know, there's a lot of information that it makes this process a lot easier for screen printing artwork on an enclosure that people just aren't going to be able to tell you because there aren't a lot of people out there who have experience with this sort of thing. Most screen printers out there just don't deal with this kind of stuff. Um, and the ones that do are probably going to tell you, well, you know, give us your money and we'll do the printing for you. But, you know, the whole point of this is to be able to do it yourself when, when you're uh, building your own pedals. I'm happy with the results. I would have gotten better results if I had had, uh, again, a thicker ink or, or a finer screen. But, you know, once I built this thing, it made it so much easier, and I am definitely going to do this again. Um, I'll probably just order some different inks. I'll, I'll order some Plastisol ink. So anyway, there they are, ready for the next part of the cheap versus expensive distortion pedal build. If you haven't already seen the first video in that series, go back and watch that. I'll put the link in the uh, description below. Um, I think it's going to be a really interesting one because we get to see what the real difference is be between common off-the-shelf components 
and some of the you know the drool worthy expensive rare components that uh, uh, people are, are willing to pay lots of money for and we're gonna find out if it's really worth the extra money or if it's just different. Thanks for watching. I hope you give this a shot at home and uh, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe and we'll see you in the next video.